Uh, I would have come here earlier, but for the hospitality extended by my dear friend Vikram Dath, who insisted on coming to fetch me, uh, and therefore we we are running a little bit uh, behind schedule. Um, I, I hope that you you will forgive me. Uh, it's really, really a, a tremendous, tremendous joy and honor to have have here your great general Justin Thomas Singh, whose uh, judgments. Um, and whose performance uh, in the Allahabad High Court um, I'm familiar with and uh, we've greatly, greatly admired, admired over the years. We were only sorry that uh, he left uh, the, the High Court uh, so soon. Uh, I know that everyone has to leave at that age, but uh, frankly, it's such good, remarkable work was being done. Um, happy also that we have here Mr. Vipin Sani, uh, Mrs. Kiran Sani, I, I believe has a special insights uh, GPS connection. Uh, Professor Chatha Singh and my, my very good friend Vikram Dutt, uh, all the members of the faculty and, and all you good people who are going to become fine lawyers one day. Uh, the topic that you've given me to speak on is in fact uh, not only very topical, but also, uh, also in a sense something that divides serious, thoughtful people very, very profoundly. Um, and I've always maintained that the best time to speak about death sentence, capital punishment, is when there is nothing on the horizon uh, of that nature. Because speaking about death sentence at a time when somebody is to be executed, somebody stands condemned, <coughs> Uh, inevitably brings in an emotional upsurge about are you sympathizing with the person who deserves no sympathy or are you do you have an unwritten uh, and undisclosed agenda about a particular cause perhaps that is an, an unwholesome <coughs> cause as far as the country and as humanity is concerned or is it is it some other reason how difficult it becomes to debate the point which is of some extreme concern to our, our, our society uh, when something of that nature is on the cards. And sadly, most of the time that we discuss death penalty is when somebody is to hang. Not when nobody is to hang. Everyone forgets this and therefore uh, the best time for discussing it is lost. There are obviously issues in this uh, which are broadly speaking, issues of uh, uh, practical nature. There are issues that are of moral and ethical nature. There are issues that are of, of sentimental nature. Uh, and I think fundamentally, if you ask me, there are issues involved in giving of death sentence that are fundamental to the very inquiry about the role of the judiciary in our country. And any of the systems that are comparable to our systems. Let me just say this, not because Justin Norrissing is here, but let me just say this. One of the finest things that you can do in life is to be a judge. Um, there is nothing greater that you can do. I know that to be a, a doctor who can save people's lives, uh, to, be, uh, to be a soldier who can sacrifice in order to protect somebody else, uh, to be a great scientist who provides uh, all kinds of facilities and all kinds of opportunities to uh, people from uh, uh, from different different walks of life, all kinds of all kinds of people have tremendous contribution to make to humanity. But um, I don't want to pitch it too high. But if you come closest to godliness, uh, it's when you are a judge, because you have you have. Not because you have power. That's not what fascinates me. Because a dictator has a lot of power. And a dictator can also decide whether you will live or you will die. But that's not a fascinating, fascinating inquiry. A fascinating inquiry is how a judge decides a case. And for me, a lifetime, lifetime has been spent on trying to discover, to delve into a judge's mind to decide how a judge decides. I, I don't know if you're familiar, you're second and third year students, you're familiar with, with the work of someone who taught me when I was, I was your age and I was studying at, at Oxford. 
somebody who taught me was a professor. We lost him last year. He passed away um, because of, of cancer. So a finest uh, mind and the finest professor that we have seen in recent recent decades. There have been two three very fine people in law, in, in law of evidence. You have, you have people like Professor Cross in, in general philosophy, uh, political philosophy. Uh, you have people like John Rawls, uh, who's been interpreted remarkably, remarkably acutely uh, by none other than Professor Amartya Sen. In economics and welfare, in welfare economics, we have our own Professor Amartya Sen, students, and so on. But in the area of rights, if there has been someone, uh, it was a man called Professor Ronald Walking, somebody that I had the good, great fortune to work under, uh, uh, to, to, uh, to be taught by, and somebody that I admired greatly. He visited India on a couple of occasions, and uh, I thought I was, I was particularly blessed to have been able to, to uh, uh, receive him at, within our home, uh, within uh, within the territory of India. But sadly, sadly we've lost him. Uh, Dawkin had, when I was a young student, Dawkin had just become professor of jurisprudence, and he succeeded another very legendary professor called Herbert Hart, H.L.A. Hart, Herbert Hart. Dawkin wrote uh, a critique of the work of Hart. Hart was a positivist. Uh, he believed in language reflecting our understanding of the judicial process. What rights people have are reflected in what language we use to express those rights. It was a, what was called the positivist school. Dworkin was different. He wasn't from the natural school, but he was, as he liked to describe himself, the liberal school of thought, uh, the right school of thought. The book that he published was called Taking Rights Seriously. And in Taking Rights Seriously, was a very important, very important lecture, which was his inaugural lecture at Oxford University, and it's a lecture called Hard Cases. You know from law, we all, we all know uh, the, uh, the, the common saying that hard cases make bad law, because hard cases are what inflict enormous pressure on a judge to be able to decide what am I supposed to do, what is right and what is wrong. <coughs> well, Dawkins, uh, had this lecture called Hard Cases, and if you get an opportunity, please read it. In the Hard Cases, he said there are two kinds of judges in the world. One judge, not surprisingly, was called Herbert, from Herbert Hart. Another judge was very intuitively called Hercules. Now we know that Hercules was, was someone imaginary, somebody larger than life, much far more powerful and much more of a doer than an ordinary human being can be. And Herbert was seen by Professor Dworkin as a very ordinary, very average judge who couldn't see beyond his nose, beyond the text that was given to him and to decide what the text says and what the meaning of the words is and therefore decide what the law is. And Dworkin says that if you have to decide what is a right that somebody has, Herbert will decide it differently and Hercules will decide it differently. Herbert will just see what does the statute say. Herbert will just look around to see what people feel. Herbert will just look at his own instinct and his training and say, well, this is, this is the right that people have and nothing more. Freedom of speech, freedom of expression. You know how much, how much disagreement there can be. And one very, very interesting judgment that you young people, two interesting judgments that you Two of you people, uh, young people, have really been very, very actively participating in, in analyzing and supporting and criticizing two judgments. One of the judgments given by the Delhi High Court, but not upheld by the Supreme Court. What was the, the judgment about, about uh, decriminalizing criminalizing same-sex activity, uh, which the High Supreme Court said must go to Parliament to decide. And the other, other one, one, one was, of course, on on the freedom of the net. Two very important cases. Now, they could have gone either way. The very fact that the High Court decides it in one way and the Supreme Court decides it in another way is an interesting conundrum about how judges decide cases. Now, it's the same quality, same caliber of people. It's just somehow a coincidence that some continue to suffer that punishment of being blind. Greater retribution. Is this 
incapacitation, a blind person is hardly likely to be able to commit the kind of crime that this person has committed. So it's virtual incapacitation. Is it a deterrence? Far greater deterrence than hanging which is done behind closed walls. Far greater deterrence because the blind man walks through life for the rest of his life and everybody knows that he's been blinded because he killed somebody. Greater deterrence. So greater retribution, greater deterrence and total incapacitation. Somebody said from the other side, from the other side, somebody said these arguments are flawed. If you ask any person, if you ask any person, would he prefer death to blinding, he would, the person would prefer death. And I answered, I'm sorry, I'm appearing for somebody who says don't kill me, do whatever you like, but don't kill me. The judges said, this amounts to legislating a punishment. And I said, no, what you are allowed to do is to take away five senses. I'm asking you to take away one sense, one sense and leave four senses. But I'm not doing this because I genuinely believe this is a good way to punish criminals. I'm only saying this because this will test your proposition that in rarest of rare cases, there is a justi justification for executing a criminal justification for death sentence. This is only a manner in which a lawyer has to argue his or her case. It's the analysis that brings you to a particular conclusion when you are arguing a case. But where is Dworkin coming? Where is Dworkin coming? Dworkin would have looked at, Hercules would have looked at a range of features. Hercules would have looked at features such as this. Is the state entitled to turn an individual into an orphan? When you hang somebody, when you execute somebody, you are also executing, in a sense, the relationship that that person has with, its, with his or her children. What right does the state have to make a child an orphan? Taking away your parents, taking away your father, taking away your mother, do you have that right, for, right to do and inflict that upon a child who has done no wrong? Would you be able to do that? What is the Indian social ethos? What is the decision that we have taken over the years, over the centuries, about the responsibility of a child and the culpability of a child and the, the, uh, the, the, the right of the state to punish a child for something their parents have done. Yourself and you're comfortable in the seat and those of you who haven't got a seat are wondering how long this lecture will go on. I haven't got a seat, I'm very uncomfortable. But those of you who are in your seats, you're very comfortable. That's your first aspiration is to be comfortable in the present. To be comfortable in a seat, to be hearing something that is not boring, to learn something and take something away from this lecture. But you also have an aspiration which is for the future. Your aspiration is to become good lawyers, your aspiration is to become teachers, your aspiration is to become, uh, become administrators, your aspiration is to look after your family, your aspiration is to, be, to make your parents proud, your aspiration as, is to have a home of your own, your aspiration is to go in the rest of the world and conquer the world as an outstanding young person coming from India. That's another aspiration. Now if I wanted in a utilitarian mix to replace all of you sitting in this hall with another number of similar people sitting in the hall equally as happy to be listening to my lecture as you are, I can do that replacement without any problem. Equal happiness replaced by, by somebody else. No problem. But if I bring in another, your number of people here and ask them to replace your future aspirations, I wouldn't be able to do it because their aspirations may be different. They may want to do something quite different from what you want to do. I can't replace the two. Now in an animal, Normally, the present happiness aspiration is there, but the future aspiration happiness is not there. An animal doesn't plan for the future. There is a little bit of instinctive, instinctive work. A bird, when it wants to lay an egg, goes and picks up sticks and makes a nest. But that's not like human beings make a house or get married or raise a family. The bird does it by instinct. Human beings do it partly by instinct, partly by thinking, partly, partly by thought process, and partly by planning. Bird doesn't plan, bird just, just does it. So you're different from a bird. 
you have a future aspiration, a bird doesn't have a future aspiration, so one presently happy bird can be replaced by another presently happy bird. But one presently happy human being cannot be replaced by another presently happy, happy human being because the human being that's happy for today also has an aspiration for tomorrow, which aspiration will inevitably be different from another human being's aspiration. Therefore, you can't replace one human being with another. These are the ways in which you have to think of what you take away when you take away a human life. What do you take away for the child, the family, for society? What is it that society demands and needs retribution, incapacitation, and of course, uh, and, 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 and of course, deterrence? But if that is available in some other form, would it then be justified in saying the death penalty is wrong? And if you believe that taking life is wrong, then how would you support a state taking life away? Fundamental, fundamental question. The only reason why further attacks where people would be taken hostage in order to get the release of the criminal. This is the major problem. But as I said, if you believe in rights, you can't simply negate rights because it's become difficult to support rights. Rights must be supported no matter what. And if you believe in a theory of rights, then you must believe that those theory of rights must survive even if it becomes very difficult to do what it takes to respect theory of rights. These are some fundamental questions about death sentence that I believe haven't yet been argued. They will be argued. I think I can see step by step Indian judiciary moving towards a recalibration and relook and re-examination of what Bachchan Singh had finally decided and what various judgments that had followed upon Bachchan Singh had finally decided. Hopefully one day this matter will be considered afresh and a new generation of judges will give to you, the new generation of lawyers, something to think about, something to work on. In a country that is, that cherishes, that is ready to, and that admires the work, the thoughts, and the philosophy of Mahatma Gandhi, of non-violence, of ahimsa, I cannot understand how we can continue to execute people. But that's only a point of view. This is something on which the debate must go on. People will have one reason or another, but the debate must go on. And as the debate goes on, we will see whether things improve or they do not improve. Has there been a true deterrence by virtue of the death sentences that we have carried out? If it is true that there is a true deterrence, should we not execute more people? Has there been satisfaction in terms of retribution? Then should we not execute more people? Has there been incapacitation because of people who have been hanged? Then why don't we hang more people? Is the other extreme questions that will arise. It will involve some research. It will in involve crunching some numbers. It will involve re-examining some of our moral positions. It would finally involve ourselves putting ourselves into that position and saying, if we were there, what would we do? We are glad, we are, we are blessed that we have judges who can apply their mind at different levels, come to a conclusion. But the important thing about a good judge is that a good judge doesn't say, this is the last word. A good judge simply says, I'm trying to look for the last word. This is the best that we can do in the circumstances. But one day, somebody born called Hercules might find the last word. But the Rice thesis does not ever necessarily find the right answer. It merely searches for the right answer. A good judge's job is to continue to search for the right answer. Whether there is a right answer or not, God only. That sentence. But because this is a topical matter, and obviously you are concerned and you read in the newspapers, you read interviews of what people have said, etc. It doesn't matter. Our society has to be strong and our society has to be tough. Simply because somebody threatens our society for any reason, for any reason, we can't give in. Because if we start giving in to threats, then we will not be a society that believes and cherishes its own values. If we have to pay a price for our values, we must pay a price for our values. That price could come in any form. If we believe that people should be executed, we must execute without any fear of reprisals. 
If we believe people should not be executed, we should not execute them without fear of reprisals. We must first be sure what we believe in. We must first be sure what we want to do, irrespective of what somebody else wants to inflict upon us. After all, as a nation, we have sacrificed before. We should continue and be ready to sacrifice again. One of us will fall, one of us will stumble, one of us will get hit and be hurt, but we will be able to save the whole society. I think that we should have confidence in ourselves rather than worry about little, little people who are threatening us from somewhere. The thesis of the Supreme Court that death sentence is necessary because of retribution, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it's tested on my saying that if you take one sense and leave four senses, um, how, does it, how does it work out? Of course, all, all theology, um, all theories of sentencing, uh, particularly more so in recent times, are now looking at reformative and both reformative and compensatory, compensatory character of punishment rather than just simple incarceration and punishment. It's, hap it's happened last week. In the Ansel's case, for instance, some people consider that consider that to be, again, an unsatisfactory solution. They say, are we becoming like the Arab world? Are we now agreeing to blood money? Somebody kills, but is, is willing and ready to pay money for, for that, uh, for the killing, and therefore they are forgiven. That was not the case. They went to prison. They served some sentence in prison. The High Court reduced the sentence from two years to one year. The Supreme Court upheld that one year sentence. The question only was, should it, before the three judges, whether it should be enhanced to two years or left at one year, and instead of sending them back for three months or four months, should they be imposed a fine of 30 crores or 50 crores, which would go towards helping society and other children recover. Now, finally, the Three eminent judges said that it is best if this goes into a trauma center and somebody else, at least in society, will benefit from this. The other thing would have been to just send them back to prison for three months, four months, the time would have passed, and nobody would have got a trauma center. Now, there are two different ways of looking at it, and no way is perfect. Frankly, no way is perfect. We all experience will teach us what to do. Now, as far as as, as far as uh, reformative processes are concerned, everybody, everybody, I think, across the board agrees in the judiciary that re reformation is very important. You can do public service, you can spend some money for a school, for a college, for something good, something noble. Some, but the point is that spending money is not enough unless you really feel a sense of remorse and you really feel that something wrong has happened and that you would want to do something to compensate for the wrong that you have done and therefore earn, truly earn the, uh, the support of society in thinking, well, here is man who's converted himself from good to bad, from, from bad to good. Uh, same thing can happen, but there are certain cases, I guess, and this is where the Supreme Court judgment applies, that it's not easy to turn a terrorist and reform a terrorist, right? It's not easy. So uh, you try talking to a terrorist, he shoots you in the head. So that's not a good way of having a conversation, particularly for you. Uh, it may be fine for him, but for you it's a very bad way of having a conversation. So there is a problem. Um, these, are, these are all uh, somewhat idealistic uh, views. Uh, we hope that these approaches succeed and they work. But uh, some of the actual facts, facts that you hear uh, and you recite what has happened in terrible, terrible crimes that have happened in our country, it's very difficult to say, don't punish them. But I'm saying is that our training tells us there must be something still left in them that we can squeeze out and see if we can convert them. And it becomes very difficult for a blind person, I'm not against supporting blindness, but I'm just saying, for argument's sake, it's very difficult for a blind person not to concentrate on reform. A person who has eyes can remain mischievous because eyes are the worst thing that a human beings have if they want to be mischievous. But, uh, but uh, if you don't have eyes, then you have to concentrate on whatever is put in front of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. They can't give judgments uh, quickly and the judgments then on appeal and then beyond that into the second appeal to the highest court, etc. takes time. Uh, just as uh, uh, Mahavar Singh will tell you, uh, there are 160 uh, 60 
judges who are to be appointed to the Allahabad High Court, you have 70 now. Uh, there are 70 and falling by the day because new judges are not being appointed, that matter is pending in the Supreme Court. So there are only 70 judges operating to do the work of 160, which 10 years ago was decided need were needed. 160 judges were needed, only 70 are, are doing that work. Now obviously, 70 are doing that work if they did only death sentences and did nothing else. Then what would happen to all the other cases? Death sentences are carried out quickly. Uh, the judgments at least come as fast as fast as possible. Sometimes they are even heard day, day to day and so on. But then there are mercy petitions. Our system allows for mercy petitions. They go to the president. The president may be a person who finds it difficult to put a seal and say, execute the person, and therefore it takes time there and so on and so forth. It's difficult. Now, courts have sat in the middle of the night, as you have seen. The Supreme Court has sat in the middle of the night. You can't expect judges to do more than that. They've sat middle of the night in order to decide that now let, let it not linger on any further. So I think that's a problem. That's an overall administrative structural problem. But it would be sensible, not just for their sentence, but for any sentence. Whatever has to be done should be done quickly and, and, uh, and promptly. But that's true also of civil cases. In many cases, you may not be punished. But the very fact that you can't get relief from court and you have to wait for 20 years, 30 years itself, is quite a punishment. So I think this is something on a high priority with every government. We are trying our best through computerization, through improvements in the systems.